You may wish to pause the recording at this point in order to read the problem statement and come up with your own method for a solution. Okay, so in this problem, we've been asked to find many things. Uh, the first couple parts of this problem are very similar to problems that we've worked in the past. So we're going to go through those solutions, but we're going to go through them relatively quickly. So first on the bat, we've been asked to find the power delivered by the turbine itself. We do this in the standard way. We apply conservation of energy to the turbine itself for steady state and no heat transfer, ignoring kinetic and potential energies, we end up with the power out is the mass flow rate times the enthalpy drop across the turbine. In this particular problem, finding H5 is not an issue because we have two properties at state point 5, pressure and quality. However, state point 4 is not known in this problem because I have only the pressure, I do not have the temperature at state point 4. So if I'm going to find uh, state point 4, I need to do something else. And that something else is to look at conservation of energy for only the heat exchanger itself. So that conservation energy at steady state, you know, heat transfer across the heat exchanger boundary, is simply a balance between mass flow rates and enthalpies. You should get something that looks just like that. Okay, so we solve that guy for H4. We know H3 because we have uh, two properties at that point given the mass flow rate, but we have to deal with the enthalpy drop of the air across the heat exchanger. Now, in this problem, we're treating air as an ideal gas with variable specific heats. So this is no longer simply C sub P delta T. I have to look up H in a table. The tables being essentially a, a table of integrals for the integral of C sub P dt from some reference temperature to a temperature at, um, of, of interest. Okay, so I look that guy up in a table. I find that it's 479.9, and then I do the same thing with H2. Okay, so if you're having difficulties remembering how to deal with the properties of ideal gases with variable specific heats, this would be a good time to find some review problems involving that concept. H3, like we uh, mentioned before, is known because we have two properties. We're treating it as steam, also a table lookup, completely different tables, mind you. But in any case, I can look that guy up and I can finally find H4. Now that I have H4, I can plug that guy back into my conservation energy for the turbine and I find that it's 872 kilowatts. Now, you might have thought to yourself, well, I could have done this in one fell swoop by making this my system, the heat exchanger and the turbine combined. Okay, So that I could have used and found the power out of the turbine without ever finding the state point four. That's true, but later in the problem, we're going to be interested in state point four because we will treat the heat exchanger and the turbine separately when we go to look for uh, the exergy uh, calculations, the extra destruction calculations specifically. So you were very clever if that's uh, what you came up with for your solution, but we have other reasons that we want to look at those two things as separate systems. Okay, so second of all, we've been asked to find the isentropic efficiency of the turbine, also called the adiabatic efficiency, defined as the power that we get out for real divided by the power we would get out if it were an isentropic uh, turbine. We have that power. That's uh, a power that we need to find before we can find the efficiency. And I do that by applying conservation of energy to the turbine. But this time, I apply it for a turbine as if it were acting isentropically. Okay, So you'll notice we have a sub S right here. And I have a subscript 5 S right there on my enthalpy at the exit state. So I look up that enthalpy at the actual pressure of the turbine exit. But with S is equal to S at 4, which I find because I know now the actual enthalpy at state point 4 along with the pressure. Okay, So another table lookup for S4 that allows me to find the enthalpy at state point 5. S, I plug that in, find the isentropic power, and voila, there is my isentropic efficiency for a turbine. 
Okay, so it turns out that it's about 0.76 for this particular term. Again, we went through those steps very quickly, but those are things that we've done in previous problems. Hopefully that's a review. Let's now move on to uh, the more interesting stuff. We're going to talk about the exergy and exergy destruction for uh, this particular heat recovery system. So we've been asked to do several things for this system. First off, where are the inflows of ex exergy? Where do they come in? Well, they come in right here and here. Both air and steam enter this system, and any exergy that they have, they bring into the system with them. So m dots times the flow exergies into the uh, system at that point represent inflows of exergy. Where does exergy leave the system? Well, just as mass flow brings in exergy when it comes into our system, it takes exergy with it when it leaves. So the air leaving the system and the steam moving the system both take exergy out. There's another place. We've got the power out of the turbine itself. That is exergy leaving the system. Now remember when we deal with exergy, we think about, uh, we think about uh, useful work and useful power. So a question that we might have is this. Is all of the power coming out of the turbine useful, or is part of it done against the atmosphere and I have to subtract something? Well, the answer is they're actually both the same. The total power out of the turbine and the useful power out of the turbine are exactly the same thing because since we're looking at a, an open system acting at steady state, the power done against the atmosphere would be P0 dV dt of the turbine, and the volume of the turbine itself is not changing with time. Okay. So most of the time, when you have an open system and you're dealing with power, you're going to have uh, power and useful power being the same thing. That's not always true. Okay, This has to be true, or this is true only when you have steady state. Um, but we deal with lots of steady state open systems. Okay, So don't remember the uh, rule of thumb. Remember why the useful power and power out are the same thing in steady systems. Finally, we've been asked to find where destruction of exergy occurs. Two places. We already know the turbine's not reversible, so that's going to destroy exergy. So there's destruction of exergy there. There's also destruction of exergy inside the heat exchanger. The reason for the exergy destruction inside the heat exchanger is that we have energy, specifically in the form of heat transfer, going from high temperature air to low temperature steam. It's not going to turn around and go back the other way. So that irreversibility destroys exergy. So we've been asked to use the accounting of exergy approach to fill in this little sheet here that kind of keeps track of all the different exergies that come in and leave uh, the system. Uh, and we're going to kind of skip over the details of the numbers that go into this just to get some experience applying the accounting of exergy to an open system. Okay, so we'll keep this in mind, but we'll fill in the details a little bit later. So let's do this. Let's look at an accounting of exergy for the entire system. So we have our inflows of exergy, our outflows of exergy, and we've lumped all the exergy destruction for the entire system as one A dot uh, destruction for this uh, entire system. We apply the accounting of exergy. It is operating at steady state. There's no heat transfer across the boundaries. So my exergy balance basically says that we have exergy flowing out because of the useful power. We have the various inflows of exergy with mass flow, the various outflows of exergy with mass flow, and finally, the destruction of exergy inside the system. If I solve that for the dis, uh, destruction of energy per unit time, I have m dot delta A for the air, m dot delta AF for the steam, and the power out of the turbine. Now, I can interpret the m dot delta A for the air as the net input of exergy because of air flowing through the system. So the uh, air comes into the system at 1, it leaves at 2, and that exergy decrease is the net amount of exergy that the air has imparted to the system uh, because of that airflow. Likewise, I can think about AF5 minus AF3 as the net outflow of exergy because the steam comes in and leaves at a different exergy. Okay? So before, I simply looked at M dot AF in as inflows and a M dot AF out as outflows, but here I'm looking at the net input and output of exergies because of particular flows. The reason this is important is because of the way the device is used. Practically speaking, we want air to give up exergy and that exergy to show up as power out of the turbine. And likewise, we'd like that net outflow of exergy because of the flow of steam to be relatively small.
Okay? So this is just a different way of arranging and interpreting these flows, but it's important because this will lead to our dis discussion of exergetic efficiencies. And notice the minus sign there because we are talking about the outflow of exergy due to the state. Finally, we have the useful power output of the turbine, which naturally is negative for the system because that's what we want. We want exergy to leave the system in the form of useful turbine power. Well, we have pretty much everything we need to calculate this quantity. The difference in flow exergy of the air can be calculated as H1 minus H0 for the air minus T0 times T, uh, S1 minus S0 for the air, and then you subtract the same quantity of state point 2. But as is often the case, when we're calculating changes in exergy, we can use a shortcut and we can actually calculate it directly and not have to calculate any properties at the dead state. That's kind of nice. So we've got delta H of the air minus T0 times delta S of the air. So if we're dealing with an ideal gas with variable specific heats, remember how you calculate that specific entropy change. There is a table lookup and there's a formula both. So I have this S super dot, which is a function of temperature only. I look that up in my table for uh, air as treated as an ideal gas with variable specific heats. And then I have this extra piece due to the pressure change of the air. Okay? You can also use E's to do that. Um, and if you use E's itself, you type in the word air for your pro or your um, substance name, and you will, in fact, get an ideal gas set of properties. If you're using the standalone E's property calculator, you will not get the same numbers. That particular tool treats things as um, real. In other words, it's not treating it as an ideal gas, it's treating it as a real substance, and you can't get away with the things like H is a function of temperature only, use a function of temperature only. And just be aware of that. So when you've been asked to treat air as an ideal gas with variable specific heats, the property calculator in this instance is not a tool that you can use. In any case, I have the numbers I need. I can plug these guys in. I'll leave the calculations up to you if you'd like to verify them. But you get 1722 kilowatts for the net air input. And you get for the steam output, looking those guys up in your steam tables, a net output of 199 kilowatts due to the steam flowing through the system. And finally, plugging all those guys into your accounting of exergy, we find that 651 kilowatts of exergy is destroyed in this entire system. Okay, so now we can think about the exergy being destroyed in two places. We can have the exergy destruction in the heat exchanger itself and the exergy destruction in the turbine. And those should add up to the exergy destruction of the entire system. So if you want to look at the individual amounts of exergy destroyed in those two systems, you'll have to treat each one of those systems by itself. So looking at just the heat exchanger and applying the accounting of exergy to that, I get a very similar equation as before. Um, no power out of the exergy. So if I solve this for A dot uh, destruction of exergy inside the heat exchanger, I have um, mass uh, times change in exergy, flow exergy of the air, and I have the mass flow of the steam times the exergy change of the steam flow across just the heat exchanger. So I'm using the properties at state point 3 and 4 to find that. Again, I'll leave the details of the calculation up to you. That's probably a good idea to verify that, but you get 385 kilowatts there. Same idea applied to the turbine. Um, there is power out this time, but only one mass flow in and out. And you plug in those numbers, and you should get 267 kilowatts. If you add those two numbers together, you find that you get exactly the same exergy destruction that we just calculated by looking at the entire system as a whole. Okay, so using those numbers, we have enough to fill in this table of exergy uh, flowing into the system, flowing out of the system, and being destroyed in various parts. Um, I created a little animation of graphics here to help you visualize what's happening in this device, and hopefully this will um, help us in our discussion on looking at exergetic efficiencies. So 1722 kilowatts of exergy comes into the system because of the mass flow of air. So that's my m dot air delta AF of the air coming into the system. When we think about the way the device is used, that's really the net influx of exergy uh, for the system. 
because the way the thing is used, we're not really thinking of the mass flow rate of steam as being an input of exergy. We're thinking about the mass flow rate of air being a net inflow of exergy. And I want that exergy imparted to the steam and eventually to the turbine itself. So 1722 kilowatts comes in. And then about 12% of it goes straight through the system. It goes to the steam, and then the steam entering and leaving at 3 and 5 respectively takes exergy back out with it. So that exergy is still available to us uh, to do something with, maybe in a later, later device, but it doesn't do anything to the system. It just goes straight through the system. About 23% of it, 385 kilowatts itself, goes into the heat exchanger and is destroyed because of the heat transfer going across a finite temperature difference. So that is now completely unavailable to us forever and ever. About 15.5% 267 kilowatts makes it through the heat exchanger, makes it all the way to the turbine, but is destroyed there because of the irreversibilities of the turbine itself. And then finally, the remaining almost 51% makes it all the way through the heat exchanger, all the way through the turbine without being destroyed. And that's what shows up as my useful power delivered by the turbine itself.